Well, this month we've been talking about joy in the series as we lead up to Christmas. The series is called Joy Came Down because Jesus came to dwell among us. And so we've devoted this series leading up to Christmas on joy. And today we're going to look at a narrative out of the Gospel of Luke. If you brought your Bible or your mobile device, you want to follow along. We're going to be in Luke chapter 1 and in chapter 2. We're going to read a lot of the text today. Uh, but it's important because what we're going to find today about joy, how to have joy in the middle of any circumstance. Wouldn't you like to know the secret to that one? Or are your circumstances just peachy these days, right? No, we, we have ups and downs in life, and we're going to focus on the life of Mary, the mother of Jesus, because she was a person of joy, and we're going to find out something that was a discipline of hers, that was maybe a little secret that she practiced that enabled her to have joy in the midst of whatever circumstances were thrown her way. And so I'm going to pick it up in Luke chapter 1 and in verse 26, and it says this, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, so just stop right there. I know we didn't get too far into this text. But Elizabeth and Mary are relatives. Elizabeth is much older. We read earlier in chapter 1 of Luke that uh, Elizabeth was married to a priest by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah and Elizabeth were old. In fact, they were so old they couldn't have children. She had never had children, and now they were beyond the point of childbearing. And yet, the angel Gabriel comes to Elizabeth and says, I know that you're beyond the childbearing years, but you and Zechariah are going to come together, and you are going to have a baby, and you're going to call that baby John. John and Jesus were cousins. We find that out later on in the Gospels. And so that's the Elizabeth that is being talked about here. So in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. That virgin's name was Mary. Now, we know a little bit about Mary. What we don't know much about is the town of Nazareth or the village of Nazareth. Actually, there is no record of this town or this village outside of the biblical record prior to the life of Jesus. In fact, the town or the village of Nazareth is never mentioned prior to this mentioning in Luke. In other words, it doesn't appear anywhere in the scripture. It doesn't appear anywhere outside of the scripture prior to the time and the life of Jesus. It was so small, and it was in a, such a remote area where no one really wanted to go, no one really traveled. There were, the scholars believed that in the time and the life of Jesus, only about between two and 500 people lived. It's a very small place, not a place that's on your bucket list to go to in life. All right? It's a poor area. It's not a big uh, commerce. And so you can understand that this area was not a place that would be uh, some place that you'd say, you know what? Let's move. Let's get a house in Nazareth. It's such a quiet, quaint place. No, there were, uh, there were a lot of stigmas about Nazareth. In fact, one of Jesus' disciples, uh, when he first heard about Jesus and the fact that he had come from Nazareth, that he was raised in Nazareth, Nathaniel said, can anything good come from Nazareth? So that's Jesus' hometown, way to diss somebody's hometown, right? So this is where Mary lives. And I bring this up is because this, Mary's circumstances in her life were not pristine, she doesn't come from a, from a middle-class family. She comes from a, four, a poor family. There's not a lot of action going on in Nazareth. A lot of people uh, talk badly about Nazareth. So there's not a lot of positive things that come out of Nazareth. And so that is where Mary lives. So verse 28, the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. All right, now, if you are raised in the little village of Nazareth that's not even on the map, like no one even thinks no, uh, well enough about Nazareth to actually put a dot on the map, you're thinking, you know what? I'm probably never going to see an angel growing up in Nazareth. Let's be honest. No one ever thinks they're going to see an angel, right? <laughs> but certainly somebody of the, of the caliber of Mary in a little uh, place like Nazareth, and yet the angel Gabriel comes and it says in verse 29, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. It's like, uh-oh, am I in trouble or not? 
But the angel said to her, verse 30, do not be afraid, Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to uh, call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. What an announcement. Hey, you're going to have a child, and this child is going to be called the Son of God, and he's, gonna, he's a descendant of David, and he's going to sit on the throne in Israel, and his kingdom will never end. No one will ever overthrow his kingdom. Isn't that great news? And Mary is stunned, and she can't get past the first part, which was, you're going to conceive and give birth to a son. She's like, uh, excuse me, verse 34, how will this be, Mary asked, since I'm a virgin? Like, this whole time, I didn't hear anything after you, heard, after you said, hey, you're going to give birth to a son, because I've never been with a man. I'm pledged to be married to a man, but our wedding, our real wedding, isn't for a long time. There's no way this can happen. She understood how this worked. So how can this happen since I am a virgin? And the angel answered, verse 35, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And result of that, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Verse 36, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no word from God will ever fail. And then Mary says this, I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. How many of you like and really enjoy and look forward to sudden change? Anybody? Nobody? So let me guess that you haven't liked 2020, right? Because sudden change came to you this year. Sudden change came to everyone. Mary's life is getting ready to be upended, and I think we have a greater appreciation for that after living through what we have lived through this year. Change is difficult. Change brings hardship. Change brings things that you necessarily don't want. And this is massive change overnight in Mary's life, and yet her attitude, note, her attitude is one of, Father, if this change is coming from you, if you're allowing this change, if you have a plan for this change, then sign me up. I don't know how this is going to work out, but I'm in. I'm in. Now, it's not easy to be in on this particular situation. Because Mary is not yet formally married to Joseph, and yet she's going to be pregnant. And everyone's going to know that she is pregnant prior to getting formally married to Joseph. And so how is she going to explain that one? There's going to be a level of shame. There's going to be a level of embarrassment because no one's going to believe the story. Because everyone knows how babies come. Everyone knows what happened between Mary and Joseph. And so no one can say, no, no, no. Mary and Joseph can't say, no, no, no. It's not what you think. Honestly, it was God. Uh, I'm still a virgin, and yet I'm pregnant. No one is going to believe that story. And so what do you do with that story? You don't tell it. Because no one's going to believe it. And so she has to go around with the stigma. She and Joseph have to go around with the stigma. This is not a great circumstantial season of her life. In fact, it's something that is going to go with her pretty much for the rest of her life. Because no one would believe the story that she told. No, really, honestly, an angel came and said this. No, I don't think so, Mary. It says in verse 39, our narrative goes on. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, and this is Elizabeth talking, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. 
But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. When Jesus came, even prior to his birth, guess what he brought? Joy. Mary, or Elizabeth goes on, Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And then note, and this is important, then note how Mary responds. And Mary said, verse 46, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. In other words, my spirit finds joy in God my Savior. Mary's circumstances are not what she would have wanted. There is massive change coming to her life. The only people that are going to believe her is Elizabeth and Zechariah, and no one really understands what the story that it is. But there is change coming on. Mary lives in an armpit of a town called Nazareth that no one wants to go to. And this is her experience. And yet, she finds some way to have joy. And at this season of her life, she's probably no older than 13 or 14 years old. She's a young teenage girl. Her life is getting upended. She has a story that virtually no one will believe. Change is coming to her. Shame is going to be upon her for something that she didn't have any choice in. God said this is what's going to happen. And yet, she finds a source and a way to look to God and say, you know what, I can, in the midst of all of these things, I can still find joy. Now I'm going to fast forward to chapter 2 of our text, and this is about the birth of Jesus. So that's about the foretelling of the birth of Jesus. This is about the birth of Jesus. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee, which is in northern Israel, down to Bethlehem to the town of David, in, uh, which is below Jerusalem in southern Israel, uh, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. So wherever your ancestors came from, that's where you went back to register for the census. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him. They weren't yet formally married again, and she was expecting a child. So here's a situation where if you're pregnant, you really don't want to make the trek through the mountains on foot to go to Bethlehem. How many of you would sign up for that one? Oh yeah, let's go to Bethlehem. No one would want to do that. Ladies, when you're pregnant, and I, my wife has had four kids, I kind of get it. She was pregnant during the summer with almost all of them, so hey, that's not a great time to be pregnant. This is Mary's situation. She's got to go through the mountains. She's got to take a treacherous uh, you know, journey. This is not a situation where you're like, oh, I'm so excited. This is not a vacation. This is a, why can't I be home with my family and with the people that I know? during this season, but she's not able to do that. This is something that is a kind of a curveball in her life, something that she would not have chosen had she had the opportunity to actually choose. But it says in verse six, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Like they can't even go back home for the baby. They register, they get stuck down in Bethlehem, and while they're there, the baby is born. And it says in verse seven, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, she wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, which is basically a feeding trough for the animals because there was no guest room available for them. Some translations say there was no room for them in the inn. Now, they didn't have hotels like we do today, like you go to a town or a city and there's a hotel that you can you know, sign up to. They may have had, uh, uh, somebody had a, a house or an inn that had a few rooms in it, but it wasn't something like you'd have hundreds of rooms. And so many people in that area would have had a guest room, a single guest room in their home, but all of the guest rooms, all of the inns, any available place was filled. And you kind of look at that and say, it's not fair. Here is a pregnant young woman who's getting ready to have a baby and no one will vacate their room so that the pregnant lady can have a room. Do you understand the the the... The situation here is not one that would say, oh, it all worked out just fine. No, she's got to put her baby boy where sheep have had their faces and 
mules have had their, I mean, it's, it's filthy. Have you ever been in a barn? Yeah, filthy. And yet, this is where she winds up to have to place her firstborn son, this special child, isn't getting special treatment because he is wrapped and he is placed in a manger because that's the only thing that was available to them. No one would help them out. And this is the text that we read at the very beginning of the series. And there were, angel, uh, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all of the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told uh, them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Now, I know we've read a lot of narrative. But here is the secret of Mary. Here is how Mary was able in the midst of all of the shakeup, in the midst of all of the, of the uh, circumstances that she would not have picked, in the midst of all of the difficulty, here is the secret of Mary's joy. Verse 19, but Mary treasured up all of these things and pondered them in her heart. Mary treasured up all of these things and pondered them in her heart. This word for treasured, means to gather uh, intently, to gather intentionally, to gather things that are valuable in order that you have access to them all of the time. That's what it means. It means that as she went through her experience, she said, this was one that I want to keep close, and this is one that I want to keep close, and this is one that I want to keep close. And it's not just that she said, here's a special event, here's a good event, because honestly, if you're Mary and you're being raised in Nazareth, there aren't a lot of those kind of events. You know how many times you get criticized, and for every criticism that you receive, how many compliments do you have to have to offset those? A bunch, right? That's the answer. I don't know what the exact answer is, but a bunch. Well, in Mary's life, she needs a lot of positive experiences, but she doesn't receive those experiences. And so she has to be very strategic about, hey, here's something that I want to uh, keep. I, I want to treasure this one up. I want to save this one up. I want to have access to it all of the time. And this word for pondered means that she uh, thought about it intently, that she considered the implications of that experience or that event. She considered the implications about the situation she was, she was uh, experiencing. What does this event mean? What do I learn about myself from this event? What do I learn about the world around me from this event? What do I learn about that person or that person or that person from this event? What do I learn about God from this event? And what she would do as she went through was very intentional. These, these phrases that you, Luke uses are very intentional. She went through and said, you know what? This is one I need to learn from. And again, she is a teenage girl. She's a wise teenage girl. And there's a reason that when she came to Elizabeth in the midst of all of that, I mean, having a baby is great if you're planning to have a baby. If you're not yet married and there's going to be a stigma about this pregnancy and all of those circumstances, <clears throat> that's not one that you get excited about except for the fact that she understood God is up to something and I'm going to trust him and therefore I can have joy because of God. Mary treasured all of these things that were happening up. She kept them close. It's almost as if she was writing them down in a book. 
and saying, you know what, it's been a while, it's been a couple of weeks since anything positive has happened, but I'm going to write this one down, and I'm going to write the details of this one down so that I remember exactly, and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to read through this and consider walk around that event and look at that event on all sides thinking, what are the implications of this? What about that? What about, how do they present this? How do, that's what she does. That's what it means. Now, if you go uh, on in Luke chapter 2 and you read a little bit more, you'll find, and we're not going to read it just for the sake of time, but you're going to find that they take Jesus and present him at the, at the uh, temple as they're supposed to. It's written in the law of Moses. There were some things that they needed to do, and so they did. And while they were there, there was a man by the name of Simeon. And Simeon had been told by God that you will not die until you see the Messiah. And so on a particular day, Simeon, Simeon gets a kind of a nudge from the Holy Spirit to go to the temple. And so he goes to the temple, and sure enough, when Mary and Joseph walk in with Jesus, Simeon knows that this is a special child. He goes over, he takes the baby, and in uh, his arms, he says some wonderful things about Jesus. He says some wonderful things about his life and what's going to happen. And then he turns and he looks at Mary. So he says both, uh, both, both to, the, uh, to Joseph and Mary, and then he looks to Mary, and then he says some things that are very troubling. And at the very end of what he says there, he says, and your soul will be pierced with a sword also. That is not something that you want to hear about your newborn baby. This is not going to go well. There's going to be a lot of ups and downs in this child's life, so much so that your soul is going to be pierced. You say, well, James, she's going to give birth to the Son of God, and Jesus, it's all going to be great. And yet, Simeon was saying, hey, listen, I'm just going to tell you, it's not all going to be roses. Your road ahead is going to be filled with some sorrow. And so we fast forward. There's only a little bit that we know about the birth of Jesus in his first few months. And then Luke turns in, uh, to verse 41. And between verse 19 that we're reading here and verse 41, there's a 12-year gap. And so we go through a 12-year gap, and this is what it says in verse 41. Every year, Jesus' parents, that is Joseph and Mary, went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, so there's the gap, all of a sudden he's now, he's a baby here, but now he's 12 years old. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. And so they, they take their family, uh, and uh, from the Bible, from the biblical text, we, we find, and scholars believe, that Mary and Joseph had seven children, including Jesus. And so they take their children, they, this is the, uh, an annual trip that they go on, and so they go up to Jerusalem, and when they get to Jerusalem, they're, you know, uh, celebrating and all that. After the celebration is done, they go back home, and apparently they are traveling with some relatives, they're traveling with some friends, and maybe the men are traveling with the men, and the women are traveling with the women, and all of a sudden, there's no Jesus. Joseph is thinking, well, I guess Jesus is with Mary. Mary's thinking, I guess Jesus is with Joseph. And then after a day of travel, when they all come together, they do a head count. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Ever done a head count with your kids? Like, where, where are they? Or if you've been chaperoned on a school field trip and you lose one, it's like, whoa. So they realize, hey, we're down one, and it's Jesus. And so they go back to Jerusalem. When they get back to Jerusalem, they look for three days looking for Jesus. How many of you parents have ever lost your children for like three minutes and freaked out, right? You're in a store, you're out, you know, at a, an amusement park or something, and all of a sudden you're looking around, you do the head count, and you're like, uh, we've lost one. So Joseph and Mary, they, they, they freak out. They find Jesus at the temple. Uh, they say, why did you do this to us? Why did you separate from us, essentially? Have you ever found your kids and say, don't ever leave the house without telling me you're leaving the house? Don't do that to your mom. Don't do that to you. You know, you're going to make us die of an early age at this, right? Kind of that deal with Jesus. And Jesus said, didn't you know that I would have been here at my father's house? And they didn't understand what Jesus was saying. And then in 50, verse 51 of chapter 2, at the very end of chapter 2, it says this. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And then here this phrase is again, 12 years later. But his mother treasured all of these things up in her heart. This was the pattern of her life. This was the discipline of her life. She was a young lady 
of joy. She was a young lady of joy when she was a teenager. Now, in this text, she's probably in her mid-20s. And we see this little thread through her life that as she goes through, not all of her experiences are good. She's got a lot of heartache, a lot of trouble. It's even prophesied that she would have heartache and prophesied that she would have her soul cut with a sword. And yet, she had this pattern, this discipline, this rhythm in her life. When things happened, she would say, this is one I want to treasure. This is one I want to keep close. And then I'm going to think about this. I'm going to reflect on this. And I'm going to reflect on it in all sides and see what all of the various implications are. You see, after the text that we just read out of Luke chapter 2, we never hear of Joseph again. We don't know what happens to him. Perhaps he dies in a work-related accident. He was a carpenter, maybe a, a captain or something that he was building fell on him and crushed him. Maybe he decided, you know what, I, I don't want this family. This is too hard because they had seven children. I don't know if you, my wife and I have uh, uh, four kids. You get a lot of kids around. It gets kind of chaotic. And you say, yeah, but at least one of their seven was perfect. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I kind of think that if one of them is actually, actually perfect, that that's probably worse than everything else because it's like, oh, brother, here he comes again. He never does anything wrong, literally. Mom and dad are always like, look, why can't you be more like Jesus? You understand the tension that's there. And if Mary does indeed raise her seven children with all of the friction as a single parent for some time. You understand her life is not easy. In fact, there is good cause to believe that there was friction among the children because when Jesus started his ministry, his brothers and sisters did not believe in him. They kind of rubbed up against him. There was some friction there that you can see in the Gospels. And yet, Mary was wise enough as she went through her life to say, here is an experience that I want to treasure. Here's an experience that I want to think about and ponder because it has implications. She was a woman of joy. And it wasn't because her experiences were easy. It wasn't because everything always went her way. Quite the opposite is true. So here's the point, here's the lesson that we learned from Mary, here's the bottom line for today is simply this. What you choose to focus upon leads you towards or away from joy. What you choose to focus upon leads you towards or away from joy. If you say, well, James, I, I, I'm not really, I uh, wouldn't describe myself as a joyful person, I don't sense a lot of joy in my life, it's probably because you're focused on the wrong things in your life. There is a discipline that comes with saying, you know what, instead of focusing on my experiences, there are a few things in my life that I'm going to focus on, and I'm going to bring those close to me, and I'm going to treasure these things up, and that means, that word means that they're close and accessible to you. In other words, they aren't things that you forget about. They're things you say, this is important, and I'm going to lean on this one, and I'm going to think about this again and again and again and again, and I'm going to consider its implications, what it says about me, what I can learn about myself, what I can learn about God, what I can learn about others, what I can learn about the world around me, and I'm going to draw strength from those moments. And sometimes those moments are few and far in between, aren't they? They certainly were for Mary. And yet, she was a person of joy. Not because everything went smoothly, not because she had a carefree life, because she certainly did have cares in her life. But she had a practice, she had a discipline of saying, there are certain things in my life that I'm going to treasure. And she understood this principle. What you choose to focus upon lead you towards or away from joy. So, what are you focused upon? The Apostle Paul understood this principle. This is what he would write in Philippians chapter 4, 
verse 8, he says this. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or worthy of praise or praiseworthy, think about such things. Look at that again, verse 8. Whatever, no, go on, yes, right here. Whatever is true, in other words, it, it, it's solid. There's no deception in that. Whatever is noble, it's, um, it, as opposed to ignoble, you know, something to look up towards. Whatever, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Do those kinds of things flood your thinking? Because here's the reality. If those things don't flood your thinking, then you are moving away from joy. And what you're hoping for is circumstantial joy that is fleeting. But as Mary understood, and as Mary demonstrated to us, joy is available to everyone based upon what you focus. And Paul says, you need to focus your mind and your thoughts on the things that lead toward joy. We, we, we hope for our circumstances to be good. We hope for good news, don't we? And when good news comes, it's fine to be overjoyed with that and to celebrate those kinds of things, but we always don't get good news, do we? We have to go through the grind in life, don't we? We have to experience pain and sorrow and disappointment and all of those things were experiences of Mary and yet, and yet, she was a person of joy. Not because things were perfect, but because she understood there are certain things that I'm gonna attach onto and I'm gonna focus on those things. You say, well, James, there's not a lot of good that happens in my life. Honestly, I mean, I, I can think back months. I, I can't think of anything that's positive. I might push back on you just a little bit, but just for the sake of argument, let's just assume that that is true. Let's just assume that that is true. Psalm 77, I think, is a good psalm for you. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. Have you ever been there? Like, God, everything seems to be just... One day leads into another day that leads into another day, and it's all bad news. It's all bad circumstances. I can't find a way to get out of the mess that I'm in. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out my, uh, I stretched out untiring hands. I would not be comforted. Like there's nothing that's changing that's getting me to a better place. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated, and my spirit grew faint. I kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. And then listen to this. I thought about the former days. So nothing that's recent. And it's not, um, it's not like a few months ago. I thought about the former days, and then this is what he says. The years of long ago. In other words, He's thinking about, he has to go back and say, you know what, I can't find anything in my own life that's good. And so I'm going to make a choice that I'm going to go back way, way back. And I'm going to think about things that even happened prior to my life. He goes on and he says uh, in verse 7, this is how he's feeling. Will the Lord reject forever? Will he, never send his, will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Ever felt like that? And then he comes back and he says this. Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. 
I will consider all of your works. I will meditate on all of your mighty deeds. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people with your mighty arm. You redeemed your people and the descendants of Jacob and Joseph, for the descendants of Jacob of Joseph. And then he goes through and he just lists things that he never personally experienced, but that God did in the past for others. There are things sometimes when you say, I I can't seem to find anything in my experience that's worth treasuring. I would push back on that a little bit and say, there probably are some things there. But even for the sake of argument, if there are not, then the psalmist is your guide to say, you know what, then I'm going to go back and I'm going to recount the character of God and how he has worked in the past and I'm going to find strength from the character of God in those circumstances. And I'm going to think about those. I'm going to meditate on those. I'm going to let those occupy my thoughts. So, I've got two questions. You say, well, James, what do we do with all of this? I've got two questions that I want you to ask of yourself. Okay? Here are the questions. Number one, first one is this. Upon what do my thoughts dwell? Upon what do my thoughts dwell? What are the things that I think about on a regular basis? Now, this is, this may seem like a simple question, but it's one that we don't often ask of ourselves. We don't go around saying, you know what? What occupied my mind today? Where did I spend my emotional energy, my thoughts, the things that I thought about all day long? Right? Because we think about a lot of things all day long. So you've got to identify, what is it? If you're lacking joy right now, then this is the question that you need to identify. What is it that I'm spending all of my time thinking about? What am I dwelling on? What are my, where are my thoughts going? And then when you ask that question and answer that question, then you need to ask this next question. Upon what do I want my thoughts to dwell? And you say, well, James, it sounds like that we have a choice. And the answer is we do. Paul said, here's what I want you to think about. Whatever is this, whatever is this, whatever is this. Paul is saying, you have a choice. And if your thoughts don't look like Philippians 4.8, it's because you have made a choice not to put your thoughts there. So, this is the, what do I want to treasure? What do I want to consider, like Mary did? What do I want to treasure? What thoughts do I want to treasure What do I want to consider? Where are my thoughts? Where do I want my thoughts to be? Because you have a choice. And here's your action step. Here's your action step. Choose and then focus your thoughts. Choose and then focus your thoughts. You get all tied up about something and you say, oh, you're worried or concerned or fearful or you get a little frustrated because something happens that you don't like and then all of a sudden you're thinking, how can I fix that? Where's the joy in any of that? How much do you control? Practically nothing. You control you. And you control, believe it or not, your own thoughts and attitudes. So start there. Choose and focus your thoughts. And it's not easy necessarily because your thoughts can go. You ever tried to think about something and all of a sudden, right? It's called ADD. I've got a little bit of that. ADD, D, 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 D. That's all right. And you say, oh, hey, I'm supposed to be thinking about this. You might want to say, you know what? I'm going to start writing some things down. I'm going to start telling a story in my notebook and say, here are the things that I want to come back to. I want to get this story right. I want to get this event right because I want to come back to this again and again and again to reflect on this, to ponder this. It's a discipline. It's a discipline that you and I can employ in our lives. And as we do, as we do, it will lead us towards a life of joy. You say, well, James, I don't have any experiences right now. I don't know what to do. This is why I've got these two scriptures. It's John chapter 3 and 1 Peter chapter 1. If you you are drawing a blank on what to think about, here are two chapters in the Bible. You don't have to read them all at one time, 
But during the next week or so, just read John chapter 3 all the way through. Read 1 Peter chapter 1 all the way through. And though you'll find some things in there to help focus your minds. Because, and here's the bottom line again, what you choose to focus upon leads you towards or away from joy. Let's pray. God, we're grateful for the narrative that we find recorded in the Gospel of Luke of not only the birth of Jesus, but the character of Mary, the experience of Mary, a teenage girl who was raised in imperfect circumstances with a lot of challenges, with a lot of change, that in some ways brought joy, but in other ways brought concern, a bit of shame, and a complicated future as a family. Even a prophecy when uh, Simeon would tell her that her own soul would be cut with a sword. And yet, Father, she found ways to have joy. Father, help us to take control of our minds and our thoughts and to focus our minds and our thoughts on the things that should be treasured, that should be considered, that we should think about and think through and learn from. And Father, may those things lead us toward the joy that you desire for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.